to, to try and just sum up for all of us what you think the key elements of the ideas that you have are. What are the key aspects of it? Well, I think putting it simply, we're, we're heading for d destruction and extinction because of our seeing the world as full of stuff that is just for us to grab. And this is effectively what we have a left hemisphere for. It's very important. It enables us to get things, to grasp things, to make things, to have things. But this is only a tiny part of what it means to be a human being. And the most important part comes from relationships. And the left hemisphere doesn't understand that. It's kind of an atomistic sense of self, where the right hemisphere has a social, emotional, connected sense of self, not just to other people, but to nature, which is what I was really uh, pointing out in the film. And I, I would say that most of the main problems that we have now come from a system of, um, that deliberately drives greed, narrows attention, uh, stops us um, reflecting, being uh, peaceful and understanding things deeply. And this leads to destruction of the environment, um, it leads to over um, abstraction and bureaucratization of everything we do. If any of you are teachers or doctors or social workers or librarians or potters or whatever, you will find that your life is dominated by systems that don't really relate to the way in which you feel connected to society, to nature and to other people. So we're losing that and we're being sold a very destructive story and I'm afraid that a lot of my colleagues are at the forefront of this. Um, a rather strange thing has happened in the last hundred years, which is that physicists who deal with the inanimate world have discovered that it's highly animate, that actually consciousness is involved with everything. And at the same time, the life sciences have discovered that the world is inanimate and that it's all really entirely mechanical. This is a terrible misrepresentation. It's not even good science. It's not really true at all that there are selfish genes that run our lives, for example. It's one of the most obviously wrong ideas. So when we start thinking of ourselves as machines, as <coughs> competing with one another more than we cooperate with one another, exploiting the natural world rather than curating it and nourishing it and passing it on to our children, then we are heading for destruction. And I, I mean, I think what's interesting, for one of the things that's really interesting for me and, and, and hopefully for other people, is that what you're describing is a way of thinking. But actually what you're arguing, I think, or, or what the film argues, is that somehow or other this way of thinking is becoming endemic. That there, there's a struggle around ways of thinking which effectively is being lost. And my question, I think, is are, are you describing a trend that's irreversible in terms of this adoption of this way of thinking, or are there grounds for optimism? Well, it's both reversible, whether, whether it's reversible in time, I don't know, because we're, we're very short of that. But it is reversible, absolutely, and there are grounds, I think, for cautious optimism. I call myself a hopeful pessimist, which means that as far as I can see it, things are not going well. But I'm hopeful because only a fool can predict the future and humanity is very resourceful and we don't know what it is that we may be forced to do very quickly to change the way in which we think. But as I say, it needs a change of heart. It needs a change of our way of relating to things. It's not enough to find eight bullet points that we can do that'll be a fix. That's what the left hemisphere wants. But what the right hemisphere sees is that we need to change the way in which we, we think about everything. And if I may give an analogy, um, 
people sometimes ask me, well, do you think that over time um, something has happened to our brain <laughs> that it has evolved in this way? Because it will take a long time to unevolve it. But it's not really like that. It's more like, if I can give a, a simple analogy, suppose you have a radio set, and when you get it, you, you, you tune in to a couple of channels that you really like to follow, and you find this is great. And after a while, you just find you tune into one channel. The other channels are still there. Nothing has happened to your radio set. It's a question of switching on and tuning in. So it is not an irreversible change. But the question is, do we have the will to change? And because it's very attractive to be lazy and soft and, and do all the things that seem comfortable, we'd rather go to rack and ruin, you know, in our comfortable chairs than we would to actually do something that will make a difference. So that's the bit that worries me. Now, the grounds I have for optimism is that, um, and I think it applies today that mostly wherever I go, I find that there is a very good spread of ages and a lot of young people who are very interested. It's not just old fogies like me. So it's very nice that young people come up to me afterwards and are enthusiastic and want to talk to me about their ideas. And the young are, are easier to approach because they've got less to lose by changing a way of thinking. Uh, co my colleagues are some of the hardest people to influence because they've got careers that have depended on thinking like this and they're damned if they're going to change it now. Um, as Niels Bohr, the great physicist, said that changes in the history of ideas don't happen because you prove other people wrong but because the old people die and new ones come up <laughs> who have a different way of looking at things. Now I am very heartened that the young people... I have three children of my own who are in their 20s, early 30s in one case. Um, and they and their colleagues are seeing the problem very vividly. I don't have all the answers. You know, I'm, I'm a diagnostician. <laughs> um, and it's hard for one person to prescribe what to do. And if I did, I'd be, limit, I'd be doing exactly what the left hemisphere does. It limit it to this is the solution that's what we do. You know, it's like that thing in the life of Brian, you know, sort of, you know, you don't have to follow me. You're, you're all individual. Yes, we're all individual. I don't want to become the person who has a, has a way of doing it. And we all go, yes, that's what we do. Because what I want to do is tap all your creativity. You're all people with ideas of your own. And I want to what I want to do is people to take up my ideas into their own lives and think of things I haven't thought of, not close it down to what I, I just me, can think of. I mean, I think, again, you know, this is a really, really atypical group, in a sense. This is people who are prepared to come out for an event like this, you know, to, to watch a film, which is in many ways challenging. It's, it's certainly very varied, very diverse. <laughs> It's got lots of different styles in it. The ideas themselves, arguably, are complex. And, and so people like the folk in front of us are activists, fundamentally, whether they're only intellectually active or whether they're physically active. And I think a number of people in the audience are. We've got people here who work in nurseries, who are fundamentally concerned with the development of care. We've got people who are activists, campaigning activists, for, for an increased amount of play, a more broad view of early education. We've got a whole range of people there. And I wonder, and, and I, I don't expect you to give them an instruction book. Now, um, I'm <laughs> hoping that's your next book. But, they, um, <laughs> but, but, but what, what would you say to encourage this particular group in terms of going forth and making that difference? Well, it, it's not, I can't give you something that will be comforting and easy. It's got to be something that you take up in the whole of your life. But there are things that we can do practically. Um, each one of us at work can be a bit of a guerrilla uh, war, <laughs> fight a guerrilla war 
against this kind of blanket mentality that tells us it's all, you've got to do it this way. I think, you know, we're all capable of saying, no, why do we have to do it this way? Why can't we do it this other way? Um, my experience is of being a doctor. And during the time that I worked professionally, I saw the way in which doctors work become more and more um, routinized, mechanized, computerized effectively. Um, and I became a pain in the neck to the system because I was always saying, why are we even doing... Well, I do see what you mean, but this is what we've got to do. Well, that's not a good answer, but that is the kind of answer you get. We've got to be challenging about the, the things that we're being told must be done this way. I think another very important thing to do is to shift the idea of education. Education is just not about instilling information. It's not about putting things in. It's about drawing things out. Um, and they won't get drawn out without encouragement. But if they're given a little encouragement, it's amazing what will come forth. That doesn't mean being just touchy-feely. And as I said in the film, it's not that we're too demanding. We're not demanding enough. Uh, education has become something most uninspiring to a lot of children. I think they need to be made to feel that there is something really there to get to grips with, but that they contribute to this, it has to come out of them, and that they learn to think critically about the ideas that are all around them. There is a kind of orthodoxy that young people can also get, which is just as damaging. So they need to be able to examine their own ideas. I think there should be, in schools, <clears throat> Children should be taught to argue a point of view that they are fond of and then told, now I want you to argue the exact opposite point of view and we'll actually score you on that. And that would be a very good exercise. I think there should be a department in government of inverted policy. So every policy <laughs> should have a whole department <laughs> devoted to finding out why this is going to be a bloody disaster. Um, and actually, this is not a bad idea, and it's, take, it's taken up um, by some people in business. They have what they call a pre-mortem, which is not a post-mortem examination after things have gone wrong, but a projection of what's going to go wrong, and if it does, why, and find out that before you go uh, too far down the line. So these are some ideas. I think, I mean, it's interesting because what you're describing is the... Department of Inverted Policy is the role of Parliament. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's the role of Parliament in terms of questioning. And what happened, I think, in line with the argument, is what we now have is we have a whipped Parliament and it only becomes the kind of inverted policy department that you're describing when the whip fails. And I think there's a really powerful metaphor, in a sense, for a lot of your argument about the kind of development that needs to take place. In other words, we need to remove the whip and we need to move towards a way of thinking. And last point to make is, I, I, I was saying to you before we started, that in a sense the title Divided Brain is misleading because the whole film, and I think so much of your thinking, is about interaction. It's oh, about absolutely. bringing together the natural and, and the philosophical, the intellectual and the physical. It's bringing together the outdoor world and the interior world. It's bringing together the two hemispheres of the brain. And I wonder if you'd just like to comment on that, Ian, before we, we throw it open to, uh, absolutely. to the activists. Absolutely. On so many levels, that's so important. I believe in the big picture. I believe in coming out of silos. I believe in departments in universities learning from and talking to one another. And I believe in people being educated not just in narrow technical subjects, they're very important, I'm sure, but they're not in themselves the basis of an education. An education is about understanding what a human being is through learning about culture in various ways and learning how to understand things in a more complex way than simply through a kind of technical knowledge. So uh, I believe in that. I also see the problem 
uh, is not, as it were, um, that there's something wrong with the left hemisphere in itself. We need the left hemisphere. It's the second most important hemisphere. Um, and from a short list. From a short list, but it is. Um, what we need is the both of them. But the difficulty is, get this. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't talk sitting down. No, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Crack on. No, no. The important thing is this. Look, we need things to be distinct enough to have a relationship. But we want them to have the relationship. It's no good them just being distinct. And there's no, no good them being fused. In this, it's rather like a good relationship of two loving people. You don't want them to collapse into one, but you don't want them to fly apart. They need to be in a kind of field of gravity of one another. Well, we need that here. And the trouble is that, and this may sound metaphorical, and it is in a way, but it's also an electrophysiological truth, that the left hemisphere tends to act more independently of the right hemisphere without realizing it needs it. Whereas the right hemisphere is very aware that it needs the left and is constantly communicating with it. So <clears throat> there is a problem about the way they view their relationship. One of them views the relationship as very important. The other says, I'm fine. I don't need you. Now that is the problem. It's too divided. It needs to be reintegrated. So that's, that's what I would say. Integration is very important, but it also depends on separation. I'll, it sounds a little bit gnomic, but I will say this. We need the union of division and union. But well, there we go. Uh, <laughs>